Association is a voluntary association of LPC registered advocates operating nationally with its head office based in Inogo Center. With its membership drawn from all nine provinces of South Africa, the association has seen rapid growth and is destined to become the biggest bar association in Southern Africa in years to come. The South African Bar Association is a LPC accredited vocation training provider and conducts pupillage training for aspiring advocates. The ongoing training and development of junior advocates and legal practitioners is a cornerstone value of the association who thereby seeks to improve the quality of legal representation in our courts. The association's flagship afternoon programs have won the respect and support of the judiciary, academics, and practitioners alike. But most importantly, the association is committed to advancing the cause of female legal practitioners and is continuously exploring and supporting initiatives aimed at making this objective a reality. Membership of the association is free for practitioners starting off in the profession. That a nominal membership fee is required. For more information, visit the South African Bar Association at www.rsabar.net. The South African Bar Association, transforming the legal profession. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, as you know, the South African Bar Association hosts a speaker on a weekly basis to deal with a legal topic intended to assist legal practitioners and any other interested persons, both locally and internationally, with training and development, which feeds into the core values that we hold as an organization at no costs to the participants. Before I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished speaker this afternoon, might I ask that you um, ensure that your mics remain muted and that your cameras are turned off during the address. And then when the answer and question starts at approximately 20 to five, um, uh, and when you pose your questions, if you want to please turn your camera on as well when you address our speaker. Uh, you're reminded that our programs are recorded and it's available on the SA Bar Association website. And now allow me the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sizwe Snell Kamatuzi. Uh, we, we met as young practitioners, I don't want to say decades ago, because I might give our respective ages away. Um, and he's going to talk to us and share his knowledge with us today on the Cyber Crimes Act 19 of 2020. Just um, as a matter of background, and he's been, as I mentioned early, obviously very busy since we last met. He's a senior partner at Snail Attorneys at Law Incorporated. Since 2015, he's been an adjunct research fellow at the University of Fort Hare and a lecturer in cyber law and IT law at LLB and LLM levels. He was appointed adjunct professor in the Mercantile Law Department of Nelson Mandela University's law faculty. He holds a LLB from the University of Pretoria, specializing in taxation law and cyber law and LLM from the University of South Africa. He is currently registered with the University of Fort Hare for a LLD. Um, Professor Snail uh, is a regular external examiner for cyber law and IT law for LLB and LLM students. Um, Professor Snail, um, I'm looking very forward to you and I'm sure looking at the numbers of our participants this afternoon, I'm not the only one. 
um, and I'm going to hand you over um, to our participants this afternoon. Thank you so much. Hi, Renel. Um, I'm just going to share my slides there with you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and no, thank you very uh, much um, for having me program, at your... Uh, sorry, sorry, Professor. I'm just going to um, ask our... Right. Just to mute all the participants and make sure that he doesn't mute you accidentally. No, yes. that's fine. We can see the slide. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, today I'm here to uh, give a presentation about what the law was and and the reason why it's important that. We know what the law was, is that there may have been crimes that may have been committed before the 1st of December 2021, but we'll get to that date later. Uh, so for that reason, it is, it is still important for us to refer to the ECT Act. So the ECT Act, the Electronic Communications Transactions Act, um, is a piece of legislation that's been with us for the last 20 years. And it had a specific chapter therein that dealt with cyber criminality. And that was mainly section 85 um, that spoke about unlawful access, including, so that was also a form of access. Then we had sections 86.1, anyone who intentionally accesses or intercepts data uh, without authority to do so anyone who causes data to be modified or destroyed in terms of section 86.2, um, and anyone who uh, provided or sold anti-security circumvention technology, right? Um, anyone who would commit such acts or the, the classic denial of service attack, right? Where you make a computer system um, of, your, of your former employer partly accessible uh, out of malice, or where you put a virus and you make it completely inaccessible. Uh, denial of service, section 86.5. Now, we also had uh, section 87 and section 88 and section 89 that related to cyber fraud, cyber extortion, and cyber forgery. So I'm not going to restate those. Um, also, people must know it's not just about the ECT Act. We have part of the RICA Act that talks about no one being allowed to communicate or, or authorize um, the interception of, of any communication in South Africa unless there are uh, legal grounds, such as an emergency or a serious criminal offense. It reminds me of the, state, the case of State versus Quele um, or uh, any other form of state interception. Interestingly, we, we know the recent case of Amabungane versus Minister of Justice and others where various parts of the RICA Act were also put down. And as I mentioned, 87, 88, 89, cyber fraud, cyber forgery, cyber extortion. Now, it may sound like I'm flying through these and I probably am flying through them because these are the crimes as it was before the 1st of December 2021. Now, you're going to say, but this Cyber Crimes Act, isn't it Cyber Crimes Act of, um, you know, 2020, right? It is, and, and there's a reason, okay? And, and let me just go slightly forward to that, right? It's Act 19 of 2020, and the reason why it's Act 19 of 2020 is that the, the, the act or the bill that gave rise to this act, right, was then given force in 2020. But what is interesting is that the commencement date, the commencement date had not been declared. And the commencement date became then 
the 1st of December 2021. But let me just go back and apologize for, for going up and down the slides. So we also have your, your Prevention of Organized Crime Act, your FICA, um, various sections on the Copyright Act, um, your prohibition on, on harassment and hate speech in terms of the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act, right? And the Harassment Act as well. And in terms of the Films and Publications Act, and I'm sure you've, you've seen quite recently some comments uh, in terms of what the FPB is do doing, um, th there was also reference there to child pornography or pseudo pornography. What is interesting now is that there have been amendments to that as well. Uh, and these are amendments before the coming of the Cyber Crimes Act, basically extending the meaning of child pornography really to the digital world as well, in terms of saying any image or any description, um, you know, and the various categories of um, uh, acts that may be classified as child pornography. So now we do have the Cyber Crimes Act, and as I mentioned to you, um, the uh, proclamation that said that, look, as of the 1st of December 2021, um, was then signed, and any cyber crime emanating from the 1st of December 2021 will now be charged in terms of this legislation. So for a, a budding advocate, uh, where you see that your client has been charged in terms of the new legislation, whereas the cyber crime had taken place before the 1st of December, this could be a way to deal with matters, all right? So the Cyber Crimes Act has got five, what I call substantial parts, because the rest are actually more procedural law. And um, judging on time, I will try and, and take us through the procedural law as well. I'm just looking at the, my watch there. So, so part one is a, a restatement of your cyber crimes that we had in terms of section 86.1, 86.2, 86.3, 86.4. Anyone who intentionally hacks a information system, anyone who intentionally modifies or destroys or tampers with data, anyone who circumvents 86.3, right? Those crimes have now been, should I put, uh, in the codified new Cyber Crimes Act. Now, you can see the sections two makes provision for the unlawful um, securing of access, right? Anyone who unlawfully or intentionally secures access to data, a computer program, a computer data storage medium, or a computer system is guilty of an offense, um, as well as the unlawful acquisition of data, right? Or the attack on data. Now, if you see section four, also talks about anyone who overcomes protection measures that are intended to prevent access to data. That would also be a, a criminal um, action. And, and unfortunately, the, the sections are the way they are. So you need to really try and, and look at the slide. But uh, what may be nice is after this presentation, um, go and, and, and have a look at the website of the Department of Justice and get a copy of the act. The last time I saw it, uh, every second page was in Afrikaans and every second page was in English. But I think there are now copies out there that are in English only in Afrikaans. But Section 5 of the Cyber Crimes Act talks about unlawful or intentionally interfering with data or a computer program, right? And an interference um, for this purposes is interference with data or a computer program, right? Section six, talking about anyone who unlawfully or intentionally interferes with a computer data storage medium or a computer system. And for the purposes of this section, interference with a computer data storage medium or computer system would mean the permanent or temporary altering or interruption or impairment of the functionality or and the confidentiality as well as the integrity and the availability of the computer data storage media. Uh, and this would also relate to a computer system um, and to unlawful acquisition, possession, provision, receipt of any passwords, access codes, or any similar data. Right. Now, section seven then also talks about 
unlawful and intentional acquisition or possession or providing of or usage of passwords and access codes or any device for the purposes of contravening any of the pre previous uh, cyber crimes mentioned from sections two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, I mean, then now we we have a repetition again of your cyber fraud and your cyber forgery and uttering here the added uttering, as well as cyber extortion. Uh, the nice thing, however, is that now in uh, and not just like in the ECT Act, there are now stiffer sentences, uh, and you will see when we get to to sentencing um, what that has to do, as well as what we call now aggravated offences. So. There was a big feeling that these sections in the ECT Act, as much as that they were there, that they were not powerful, and that the sentences were very uh, low, and that you know not a clear message against cyber criminality was being sent out. Hence, now we have Section 11 that um, you know has these aggravated offences. Now, anyone who commits an act in terms of Section 3, 5, or 6 um, um, of the Act. These are the, the sections, let me just go back. Uh, these are the sections that we had there on, on this slide. Anyone who commits those acts insofar as passwords and access codes or similar data um, of a restricted, now a restricted computer system here would be anything that is under the control of a financial institution or an organ of state as classified in the constitution uh, or a court of law or anything that is protected by way of security measures against unauthorized access or use. Now, here we have the interesting sections dealing with um, anyone who incites uh, violence uh, to damaging of property. I remember uh, when the, the riots came, there was one or two commentators who mistakenly referred to the section, and obviously the riots being uh, dealt with in terms of that, because uh, that happened prior to December 2021. It's an interesting question that might to students. Section 15, um, anyone who talks about or discloses and threatens anyone to damage your property um, in the electronic space as well, using data or unlawfully threatens or uses other per persons to threaten you will also be criminally liable. So we'll be quite interested to see how that particular section will be interpreted by the, the courts. Um, and just keep looking at time just to manage. Then we, we also have now the, the provision in section 16, the one particular dealing with uh, revenge porn. Now you've, you've been hearing this, I think it's been a while now, that there is going to be this law that is dealing with revenge porn. So yes, there is finally now a law that deals with revenge porn. And what is revenge porn? That is in an instance where you most probably may have uh, you know, consented to a video of yours being taken. And at some later stage, you, you then notice that that specific person who took the video is no longer your partner and they're disseminating this video out of spite, you could then uh, take legal action against that person in terms of revenge porn. So this is an interesting section as well in development in the cyber law that one should look at. And what is also important, and I want to just go back, um, the, the sections here, which I referred you to there, about you know harassment and hate speech. I mean, these are still valid. You know, these are sections that are going to be working with the Cyber Crimes Act, right? Um, interestingly enough, you will see later on they've built in a very interesting mechanism now um, in 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 section 20, and I'll tell you about this mechanism. So anyone who attends anyone who conspires, anyone who helps, aids, um, anyone who participates in the site as, as much as the, the person who actually did it. So that's 
uh, we have there, and then we also have this section now of competent verdict. Now, you may have been charged with section two and three, when in actual fact, during the course of the investigation, uh, the, the evidence comes out quite clear that you've actually contravened sections 11 and maybe sections um, 8 and 9. And then on the basis of that, the, the presiding officer then will also be empowered to, to uh, give competent verdict. So this is a very powerful tool to the prosecutorial uh, side. Now, sentencing. Uh, in the in the old sorry, from five years and and a fine, uh, we now have serious sentences here. I mean, we have sentences coming now from five years and a fine uh, as tears um, uh, and a fine, um, you know. And in the instance of the um, the the aggravated ones, um, which I mentioned, let me just go back to the slide of aggravated. Yeah where you attack a restricted computer system. Remember, when we said a financial institution or any organ of state or anything that is protected by security measures as well as a court of law, right, then you could be found guilty and you may go to court, I mean, to jail for 15 years. Okay? Right. And um, there are further sections in Section 19 dealing with sanctions and factors that must be considered when uh, dealing with sentencing there. So a very long uh, list of factors that can be looked in there and also looking um, at other aspects in terms of uh, whether to impose a sentence of direct imprisonment um, with or without a fine. Um, it has been really nicely set out for the for the courts. Now, I said to you that there's a mechanism now that they have built in. Now, when the commencement started on the 1st of December, it was mentioned that certain sections would not be in commencement. And, and this partly also related to this section, because this section basically says that whilst a criminal case is taking place in terms of um, you know, where you are being threatened, uh, where you're being you're, where you're being harmed in terms of 14, or you're, or someone is inciting people to cause da damage to your property in terms of 15, the court will be able to to give out a protection order, a interim order, whilst the matter is still being prosecuted. Bearing in mind that criminal prosecution does not happen overnight, um, and and the same goes also for an interim order for anyone who would be. Uh, accused of um, the uh, revenge porn. Remember the one where we discussed where you are disseminating materials. Now, it's not just about substantive law, right? It's also about the powers of investigators to search and to seize and to access evidence. And what is beautiful is here is now, you know, they've, they've really defined terms such as access investigator and, and and terms like seize, what to seize. And, you know, they have really given us a, you know, a standard operating procedures which must point out how different personnel uh, will have to conduct themselves in the collection of evidence and the prosecution um, and the investigation of a cyber crime. So, uh, you know, the, the act has really now given teeth to, to prosecutors to deal with cyber criminality. Section 28, conferring a police official the authority to search, gain access, or seize any article uh, that, that would be relevant to the cyber crime. Um, and we now also have this powerful tool of an oral warrant. Um, think of the days of where you have to go and open a case, then you have to do an affidavit. And by the time that is done and you get your warrant, the cyber criminal is gone and off. Now you can have a oral application to a presiding officer, something like you know an urgent one, um, an urgent oral application, where in terms of which um, a police officer can be given authority 
to go and conduct an arrest um, and, and do certain search and seizures. Now, Section 34 makes it now obligatory, obligatory for any electronic communication service provider, for any of you who act for them, financial institution, or persons who are under control of information, objects, or facilities, uh, to assist the police in any cybercrime investigation. Okay, and anyone who hinders uh, a police officer will be guilty of a, a criminal offence. Uh, and also, you know, it is very, very important that the police officers uh, exercise their powers decently without infringing people's rights. So that has also been considered. Section 38 also making it an offence where you give a false statement under oath where there's a cyber criminal investigation. Um, and then this, this was the sections that had also been suspended. And these were the ones for the preservation of a data direction. In other words, now where the court may order the preservation or the expedited preservation of data. This is akin, and I'm saying akin to the Anton Pillar, but it's not because you, you would ask for an expedited preservation order uh, so that you can get the, the, the evidence now. It's happening now in real time, okay? So uh, that was one of the sections that had not yet been also put into force. Um, then we also see now that the, the national commissioner or the head of the directorate uh, may now have, you know, cooperation agreements with the foreign um investigation authority and now there is this plan for a designated point of contact where we assume that the saps will have a central point where you can give a uh, report a cyber crime and get help and also be assisted further now the the evidence here right that we are dealing with here is not the same evidence that we are talking about in terms of Section 15 of the ECT Act. This e-evidence is um, also basically setting out uh, how an affidavit must be written by any expert who will be adducing any evidence to the criminal court. Um, like I said, I, I flew through those slides and I would have hoped to have spoken a little bit longer but I was trying to make sure I keep within the time. Uh, um, Advocate Ferguson, can I give back to you? You've got, got lots, of, lots of time. Um, uh, you've got at least another 20 minutes. Um, uh, Professor, you are muted. Oh yes, sorry. Now I was saying from the from the formal slides perspective, I, I would say that we've managed to, to conclude those, but I would really like to engage with the audience if if there would be any questions that, that anyone wants to ask, then maybe we can use that time constructively. Yes, thank you very much. I see Eric Kotler has asked um, uh, what then happens in a situation where one loses their phone or gets hacked and the material pornography in the phone gets distributed. Would that still be regarded as revenge porn? Not really, because, um, you know, the revenge porn requires that you must have had, you know, somehow a, a previous relationship with this person, you know? It would basically then just be dissemination of your material unlawfully so if it was stolen. So it wouldn't necessarily be revenge porn, but whoever would be doing that would also be, you know, criminally liable for distributing uh, naked material of yourself. All right, here's another one. How does section 25 and 26 differ from a regular Anton Fuller preservation order? Okay, like I said, you know, the the Anton Pillar, and that's why I said akin to an Anton Pillar, we, we know that the Anton Pillar is used to go and preserve evidence 
that we're going to use later on, uh, most probably in an action proceedings to maybe prove copyright. Now, in, in this particular instance, this preservation order, and I said Akeen, in essence has the same purpose. It is there to preserve evidence that would be during the commission of a crime, which under other circumstances would maybe become spirited away or would not become available. So I think it's almost the same test. It's just that the one is used for civil law and the other one now is, is a power that has been given to, to the criminal law to, to preserve evidence under certain circumstances. I hope that, that clarifies that one. That, that clears it up for me, um, uh, Bart, if, if you want to take that question further. Could I then also, Bart says, where does one's cause of action arise when you are the victim of cybercrime? It sounds to me as though we've got um, in, the, in the act, I almost want to say the new act, that that addresses the, the criminal procedure. But then there's, of course, also a delictual um, consequence. Um, uh, where does the cause of action lie, Bart asks. Okay, so I guess there's a bit of, of mixture of, of the cyber crime and, and a little bit of the, you know, the stuff that we're doing in court. But let us assume you are the victim of, of a cyber crime relating to your American Express uh, details because you happen to be an American Express holder and your details were leaked in America. Oh, by the way, this is just a hypothetic, <laughs> nothing against American Express. So mm -hmm. um, they then lose your personal information on for your credit card and then as a result thereof, someone uses it. Where could you sue? Well, in terms of the Cyber Criminal Act, we have a, a long arm of jurisdiction. Similarly to the old section 90 in the ECT Act, if the crime started in, in SA, if it was concluded in America, or, or if there was a link between the two countries, right, then South Africa would in any event still have criminal jurisdiction. But when it comes to uh, civil uh, uh, causes of action, interestingly enough, you know, according to the American law, they've got different tests things like the effects test that they use to, to farm jurisdiction, you know? Uh, did this action have any effect on the defendant in that jurisdiction? Um, you know, then they, they have all sorts of interesting uh, tests that they have there as well. They, they also have the jurisdiction test on a sliding scale where maybe there's a dispute as to which state in America should adjudicate on a particular matter. Then they look at all these various different factors as to who may have jurisdiction, uh, maybe because the, the delict took place in that particular state and, and things like that. So uh, there's no all in one answer for that one. Uh, we'll have to deal with that uh, on a case by case basis, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to engage a colleague if you have a matter relating to cybercrime and or, or a foreign cause of action against someone. I'm, I'm happy to assist. Do I understand it correctly oh. then, Prof, that when um, a cybercrime is committed and you suffer damages as a result, that the prosecution of the cybercrime well, then, like in any other delict, for example, assault or negligence would then, well, not negligence, but, but assault, for example, would form the basis of a separate civil action. Um, and it seems to me that the act then facilitates the process of procuring the evidence to prove the delict in a civil claim. Sounds right. Okay. Sounds right. Sounds, <laughs> sounds right. And and you know to to, to take it a step further, uh, as in any criminal action, if you have suffered damages as a result of the criminal act, in any event, 
you would then be allowed to pursue civil damages against that particular perpetrator as well. Right. The questions are rolling in, Prof. Does one need... That's good. <laughs> it's good for, for, for half past four on a Thursday. Oh, we're doing well. So Sandile asked, does one need to depose to the affidavit when applying for a protection order, protection order under the Cyber Crimes Act? I think you've mentioned that, but perhaps um, you can just clarify for Sandile. Okay. Uh, it, it, it is a protection order. So I would assume that the, the, the normal rules pertaining to any application would would take place, you know. There, there would have to be a signed affidavit uh, before the court, and on the basis of that affidavit, the court then would be able to, to give out this order. And I would assume the affidavit would uh, constitute, may even constitute your statement to the police. You know, that first statement that you have given to the police, um, if, if Prima Fakir from that statement and the court can make out, and and I don't know how exactly they intend to make the rules for this, but I'm just using common sense that you you would be able to, if there's prima facie proof of a continued contravention of this crime, on the basis of that affidavit or an additional affidavit if necessary, with the recent decision of of Knut. Now, this um, electronic commissioning of an affidavit, right? And and that shouldn't be confused with with your question. Your question says, would you still need an affidavit to to you know get that protection order? I I would safely say I think you would need a affidavit to to get any order from any court, or you would have to give evidence, maybe they would make provision for evidence to be adduced by video of people coming up with. So I wouldn't be surprised if they would allow for, for evidence to be adduced by way of electronic means, for instance. Yes. Okay. I think that covers it. Um, uh, Nandi asks, how do you see Chapter 6 interfacing with the critical infrastructure guarding responsibilities? How ready is the organ of state to take up the responsibility? And how does Chapter 6 embrace the IR responsibilities and jurisdiction? And then she goes on to say, thank you for the great presentation. <laughs> for any state institution, uh, I used to work for a state institution part-time the last five years, but I can't even speak for their behalf anymore. So I would say what is important is, you know, I think it's all about capacity. It's all about capacity within these state organs to be able to, number one, um, you know, have people who are competent to first investigate cybercrime incidents. I mean, it would be a beautiful day where you walk into a police station or there's a particular point of contact where you have a competent police officer who listens to you and gets your cyber crime the first time, you know? Mm -hmm. So capacity, I think, is very, very important. Um, and then not just in terms of the, the police officer who takes the, the statement, but also those who investigate, you yes. know? I, th I think we need more uh, IT technicians and you know, um, there has been a, a very, a very bad influence by the law, I must say. Very, very bad influence in the law when it comes to things like cyber criminality, because we as lawyers have made it our own little domain and we, we forget that we actually need ICT specialists. We need the, those um, uh, forensic scientists. We need those BSc scholars, those cum laude guys, those brilliant guys who, who lead from the universities. We need those people to work for the police services to, to assist them in, in investigating cyber crimes and also assisting them in collecting evidence in a manner that will be properly adducible before court for successful prosecution. So it's not just about us, the lawyers. I know we, we love ourselves, we love our profession, but in terms of building capacity, I think 
um, one must really try and have a lot of ICT specialists also within the space to facilitate uh, investigation and prosecution of cybercrime. I think that, in fact, would be the starting point of a whole new batch of experts. Exactly. To, to assist the judiciary in under, not only collecting the evidence, but assisting the judiciary in understanding it. All right, the next two questions seems to go hand in hand. The question is, how do you see the delayed cybersecurity legislation embracing the current cybercrime one? And then goes on to ask, what are the commencement realities of the various provisions of the Act in relation to the ECT Act span of life in relation to the offences committed? Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to start with <laughs> the first question. Okay. Um, we'll all recall it was called the Cyber Crimes and Cyber Security Bill in 2015, at some stage, 2016. I was actually one of the people who said, hey, look, you can't have these two pieces of legislation in one thing. And, and, and government listened, and they separated the Cyber Crimes Act from the Cyber Security Provision. Provisions. Um, I, I don't have any particular knowledge of, of you know, where the, 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 the cybersecurity uh, bill will be, uh, but I'm, I'm quite sure they will try and make sure that they do complement each other. Because I've always said, although cybercrime and cybersecurity are not brothers and sisters, they are cousins, okay? And they have a, a common ancestor a common grandmother, a common grandfather called vulnerability. <laughs> right. And, 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 and the one deals more with the aspect of securing the space and ensuring that intruders don't get into the space or in the event of intruders getting into the space, ensuring that they don't get into the space again, while as cyber criminality talks more about the do's and the don'ts, um, or to put it into simple legal terms, the substantive law and the procedural law relating to cyber crime. So um, I, I, I hope that when they do eventually come out with this legislation, that the two do speak to each other, as well as the, the Critical Infrastructure Act. I noticed quite recently that the Critical Infrastructure Council has, has been inaugurated. The, the Minister of Police, Mr. Begi Tele, signed same. One of our esteemed colleagues, Advocate um, Lufuno Chikalange, uh, she's one of the members of that council. So I just wish to congratulate her for her appointment to that. So there, there will have to be a, um, a synergy between cybersecurity policies and legislation, as well as the Cyber Crimes Act. And I think we'll just have to wait until uh, the, the government comes out with, with these pieces of legislation and how they will work together with each other. I mean, the POPIA, for instance, the Protection of Personal Information Act, um, is a very powerful tool. I mean, it also has, uh, in one of its conditions, a, a condition that, that puts a positive duty on anyone who stores and collects data, in other words, anyone who processes that data, to ensure that that particular person um, maintains the confidentiality and the safety and the security of that data. Okay. So as of last year, the 1st of July, if you have anyone else's data, you don't just say, ah, we got hacked and we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to keep quiet because it's going to mess up our Werfkrach and our business's good name, no. In terms of the new Cyber Crimes Act, there's self-reporting mechanisms. There's also, in terms of the POPIA, there's a mechanism to uh, report breaches, which would be any loss of data um, uh, or, or, or any breach of data um, of any of the data subjects. So, you know, all these pieces of legislation, they really piece in together. And, and it's, it's it's actually the focal point of, of, of my uh, doctoral thesis, which I'm currently busy with, to say that 
all these pieces of legislation, cyber criminality, cyber security, um, as well as data protection, they all have a common thread, which is the protection of data. And then the other one has consequences for lack of protection of the data. Others has consequences for the criminality of certain actions. And then the other one also relates to the cyber security aspect of that data. I hope that's not a mouthful. <laughs> it certainly is, Prof, but I don't know you any differently. So <laughs> there's another question here. How would you then see the current cyber crime being implemented within the protection of territorial integrity mandates within cyber domain? Okay, so, so the debate of uh, territorial space uh, on the internet or internet territory space or internet space, it's a long debate, okay? Um, I've, I've, I've mentioned that the ECT Act Section 90 from a criminal aspect had this long arm of jurisdiction. The Cyber Crimes Act also has a long arm of jurisdiction. Um, however, when it comes to internet territoriality, uh, and, and I'm specifically using those words, uh, internet territoriality and internet space, you're going to say, but does anything like that exist? Do we, do we now put geographical space holders to the online space? And I'm going to say to you, we actually do have that. We do have mechanisms for instance, uh, for those of you who watch Netflix, like I do, uh, there are certain movies that we can't watch in South Africa, and that's not an ad for Netflix, <laughs> that we can't see in South Africa at a particular time because of whatever copyright issues. And using technology, they can then block us out from the South African internet territorial space. But, but as you all know, there are technologies, there are ways to reroute yourself and to make yourself um, um, anonymous or make yourself root through another country. So I'm, I'm not going to go into that from the technological point of view. But we've had uh, the, the famous case of um, the French League against uh, anti-Semitism versus Yahoo, where Yahoo was taken to court for uh, facilitating the sale of Nazi memorabilia and swastikas. Now, you would know that in, in any part of Europe, um, after the Second World War, anything referring to the Nazi, even the word Nazi, unless in the historical context, or the use of the swastika uh, is, is, is deemed unlawful. And these guys actually took Yahoo to court and said, look, within the French internet space, you must be barred from selling this. And the, the court in Paris actually granted an order ordering Yahoo to ensure that within the French internet space. So what is previously as a, uh, a seen as a, you know, a debate, um, do we have um, territorial internet space is now a reality. The courts are, are accepting it and, and even in cyber warfare, We've, we've seen uh, countries now using cyber warfare to actively engage in war and also try and protect themselves. Again, a mouthful. <laughs> That's very interesting. I see, I see Ayavuya um, yes. asks, uh, does this act take into consideration transactions concluded with digital currencies or NFTs, fraudulent transactions? Okay, so the, the position regarding cryptocurrency in South Africa is, is quite clear. Uh, it is not considered, uh, considered legal tender in, in terms of, of money, you know. Uh, however, I think the Reserve Bank has not had the you know the head in the sand approach they've had a, a different approach they've had a more regulatory approach to to try and regulate uh, uh, cryptocurrencies we have heard also of 
courts in South Africa uh, dealing with, uh, for instance, uh, cases where cryptocurrency was used as a consideration, uh, a consideration in pyramid schemes, okay? So I, I, I do think from a legal perspective, uh, cryptocurrencies do have some form of consideration. And I've also seen in one or two judgments where cryptocurrency was was agreed upon as the method of payment, you know? So, uh, uh, and, and the courts are open to this. Our courts are open to this. So I, I do think in the not so distant future, we will have some form of cryptocurrency regulated even in terms of our laws. I would, I would imagine so. Uh, we only have to see what the big millionaires are doing with the Bitcoins and how they manipulate the markets. So I have no doubt um, that we'll see a lot more of that. All right. Um, uh, as far as posted questions are concerned, I don't see any new questions. If anybody else has a further question, um, you can just raise your hand on the participants list. I've got that in front of me and I'll take care of you. In the absence of that, in conclusion, Prof, Yes, you were saying? In conclusion, this new legislation takes us in the profession. What can we expect um, from, uh, sorry, Prof, I lost, your, I lost your video there. Yes, no, I, I, I tried to switch it on and off because it, it was flickering. Oh, okay. Yes, saying? Um, in conclusion, where would you say the new legislation is going to take us as a profession? What can we expect to see in our courts? I think we're going to see smarter advocates. Uh, <laughs> we're going to see smarter lawyers. Uh, and we're also going to start seeing um, very smart opponents. In other words, advocates and lawyers who are maybe prosecutors. Uh, you know, not too long ago, I did a matter in, 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 in the Randburg Magistrates Court relating to cyber criminality, and I was so impressed how the prosecutor there, and I'm not going to mention him by name, actually knew the sections in the Cyber Crimes Act and everything. And I was like, yeah, no, we are getting there. So it, it, it is an area of the law which, um, when, when you and I were uh, still doing some of the trainings that we used to go to, was considered PlayStation law. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they used to call me the PlayStation lawyer, the tax, mm -hmm. but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer PlayStation law, it's reality. Mm -hmm. um, legal practitioners, and if you go read the, the case of Herald versus Wilt, uh, the judge there makes this beautiful analogy where he says, with the evolving technology, not only are the judges faced with legal questions that are uh, difficult to deal with in terms of giving solutions, but he says, and he applauds the practitioners in that case, he says it also requires legal practitioners to be astute and to be well versed in matters dealing with technology. So for any legal practitioner who in 2020, especially in the advent of COVID-19 and considering that we do court via case lines and teams these days, um, any attorney who does not have a laptop who thinks that by having a smartphone, he can go and do one or two phone calls or do business, that is, um, or, or an advocate, that is the long gone. You need to have an office that is fully equipped with technology. Um, you need your laptop. Um, you need your nice phone for that emergency, uh, Zoom emergency Teams call. Uh, but, but we really need to embrace technology, even the way we communicate with our staff. Um, you, you could be doing business in another city. And, and I've been doing business like this for a very long time. And I remember when I first started uh, my cyber law practice, I would get invited 
literally to conferences all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was pre-COVID, you know. But I was forced to create a system where I, I can communicate with my office. So, you know, we started using WhatsApp. Now you need to have 365, things like that. And it's not an ad for Microsoft either. <laughs> you know, you, I'm just mentioning tools that you can use effectively in the management of your practice. Well, Prof, um, since we have spoken, uh, have not spoken for such a long time, this has got a lot to do on how Virtual Chambers was born. I, I wanted to congratulate you for that. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to wait for the end to say no. that I've been watching, I've been looking, <laughs> it's some great stuff. And, and I think that goes for the entire profession. Um, the, the geographical limitation of our practice is a thing of the past. As, you know, the ISO Bar Association, you would have seen in the inter introduction, they embrace the geographical expansion of the membership. Um, and and that's, that's simply the future. That's where we're going. Prof, thank you so much. I am um, going to catch up with you before this week is over. Um, uh, we've got lots and lots to talk about. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your knowledge and for the intellectual capital that you shared with us this afternoon, early evening. Um, uh, I can see from the questions that came through, it's obviously very topical. And it's nice to know that we've got an expert to reach out to. Um, uh, the more and more um, this, this topic comes our way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Ciao. I've also been asked to mention next week's um, uh, afternoon program. Um, uh, I must say, uh, the SA Bar Association managed to procure the presence of um, uh, Mr. Pandelani, who is the Solicitor General for the Department of Justice and Correctional Development. Uh, make a note in your diary, keep your eye on, on the link that we'll send in the week. Um, and oh, there's a lovely message thanking Professor Snail again. Um, keep your eye on, 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 on the link for next week. Uh, thank you again, Professor Snail. Um, uh, enjoy your evening.